Uh, for those of you in the, here in this part, uh, I think we try to save some of the best cases for last. And so uh, without further ado, I, I will get started here. Uh, Wally Omar, uh, you're up first. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for sticking it out on this Saturday morning. So I'm going to present a case of a pseudoaneurysm, a little bit of a different type of pseudoaneurysm. Um, so this is a percutaneous closure in a patient with cardiogenic shock. Those are my disclosures. So the case is a 70-year-old woman with a history of Barlow's disease and resultant severe MR who underwent minimally invasive surgical mitral valve repair. They thought the mitral valve repair went great, but had a very difficult time weaning her off of the transfemoral bypass after completing the repair. So the surgeon took a further look and noticed that there was a quote unquote small vent perforation at the apex of the LV, which he oversewed with some sutures and thought that um, he got a good result from that oversewing. But despite that, the patient continued to require VA ECMO after they closed the chest. Um, and eventually, once they weaned her off of ECMO, she had fulminant RV failure, requiring placement of mechanical circulatory support in the form of a Protect Duo. So an echo was done. And on this echo, you can see that she had a VSD with left to right flow, a very, very large QPQS ratio of 4.7 to 1, with an enlarged RV and diastolic flattening in both systole and diastole. So at this point, the patient was transferred to our facility, and we did a little bit more imaging with a TEE. And you can see here on the left that there appears to be this complex structure uh, where blood is flowing from the LV apex into the structure and back into the RV apex into the RV. Uh, and on the right, you can, you can see that as well. So this was noted to be an LV pseudoaneurysm at the, uh, sorry, a pseudoaneurysm at the LV apex connecting into the RV apex as well. And the neck was measured to be 18 millimeters at the LV apex and a 12 millimeters at the RV apex with mostly left to right shunting. Here's just some more imaging of the RV connection. And then I like the short axis view on the right, especially because you can really see the, the flow pattern here and how complex the pseudoaneurysm appears. So heart team discussion obviously ensued, right? The patient required continuous support in the form of an RVAD, a balloon pump, inotropes. Uh, the surgeons thought that surgical repair would require cardiopulmonary bypass and deemed it to be extreme to prohibitive because of that. Uh, so we decided to proceed with transcatheter closure of the pseudoaneurysm. So on the left here, you can see our LV gram flowing from the LV into the apex, into the RV, and back up the PA. And so that's what we started with. We decided that if we were to close this device, we would need something that had some integrity. Uh, so we decided to use a post-infarction VSD occluder here. These are the um, Abbott Amplatz uh, devices here. And uh, I, I think you remember the, the neck of the LV apex uh, was 14 millimeters. So we just decided to go with a large device. Um, luckily, all of these fit into a 10 French sheath. So here's our AV loop. We had a snare ready in the PA via the IVC, took a JR4 catheter into the LV, uh, and used a glide wire and a glide catheter over that glide wire to make sure that we didn't damage any structures snared that glide wire and externalized. And then we advanced the 10 French sheath via the IVC through the RV, through the pseudoaneurysm into the LV. And we decided to use a 14 millimeter disc here. Uh, so on the right, hopefully it plays, you can see deployment of the LV side, of, uh, sorry, of the, um, yeah, of the LV side of that disc, sorry, the RV side of that disc, um, and bringing it back into the pseudoaneurysm here. So we were able to deploy uh, that portion, once again, LV side. But we had trouble deploying the proximal edge of the disc here. So you can see the proximal edge was getting crushed into the pseudoaneurysm. And at this point, we didn't really have much of a choice. We could not advance the sheath back through the pseudoaneurysm into the LV um, at this point. Despite multiple times, uh, there was a lot of pressure that we used, um, but 
ultimately did not want to perforate anything. So we decided to just deploy the disk as it was inside of that pseudo aneurysm and use a second disk to close the RV aspect of this. So we deployed, this is the LV deployment here. And you see the pseudo you see the disk, the proximal disk getting crushed into the pseudo aneurysm. And eventually we were able to deploy the RV side, which is a smaller disk at 14 millimeters. So luckily this was successful. Uh, you see here on the left, this is our pre-closure uh, TTE. And on the right here, you can see the post-closure with no significant flow from the LV to the RV. So the patient was weaned from the balloon pump, the Protect Duo, and extubated over the course of the next week. And two weeks later, uh, she had a right heart cath. QPQS showed um, uh, a ratio of 1.6 to 1. She was ambulating and eventually left the hospital. And this is her echo one year later. And you can see uh, her LV function looks very good there. And you, let me go back here. LV function looks good and you don't have any significant flow from the LV to the RV. So in summary, complex cases require extensive pre-procedural planning, discussion with our surgical colleagues. Uh, this was a case in which the Amplatzer VSD occluder device was safe and effective in sealing an iatrogenic pseudoaneurysm. Deployment of two devices, although unintended, was just as effective in sealing the, in sealing the pseudoaneurysm and the defect as one might have been. And uh, future cases, I think in the future, if we were to do this, we would probably use some more imaging, right? So CT imaging, 3D printing uh, to plan this case as needed. Thank you. Fantastic case. So uh, um, uh, a lot of these post or whether post-infarct or however injurious uh, defects uh, are in terms of their challenges that it's hard to get the disc to lay flat. You know, and, and oftentimes I get frustrated because when the discs don't lay flat, then the neck is stretched and then you have leaked through the, uh, th through the, the defect you're trying to close. But congratulations, I mean, it's a really nice case. Did you consider leaving a, an anchor wire behind? Because it looked like when you deployed the first disc, you had trouble pushing your delivery catheter to go back over and recapture. Maybe an anchor wire, if you had left behind with a larger sheath, might allow you to recapture? Absolutely, yeah. I think uh, that was uh, in the discussion after we ran into that issue uh, where we weren't able to advance that. But in the future, I think an anchor wire would certainly be helpful for this exact reason. If we do have difficulty deploying, we can advance and, and recapture. Yeah. yeah, We like anchor wires because especially for something that takes a lot of time to recross, it saves that time. But absolutely, yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. Use a 12 French and just put a 018 up alongside and leave it in the aorta that you can recapture. This is an interesting defect, right? Because it, it, it wasn't really an infarct, right? So right. it was some mechanical uh, complication of the LV vent that somehow created this. So the tissue, the muscle was not necrotic. Right. So that was favorable. You had good anchoring. That's the issue usually with the post-infarct is it's necrotic and you have to oversize quite a bit. I think you were but the, 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 it was a strange thing. It was almost like a tunnel-like defect. It's almost like it burrowed through, uh, <clears throat> and that, that maybe explained why your, your, you know, your, right atrial, your right ventricular just didn't expand. I mean, it was, I think a CT would have been very helpful to really understand this tube-like structure. Absolutely, yeah. And I think, uh, like you said, it wasn't necrotic. It was, we, we did it in the first couple of weeks after the perforation, so I think that was working in our favor. Yes. I think uh, even now it would be helpful to get a CT so we can understand what happened because it's a little bit hard to appreciate the, uh, the 3D anatomy. Um, that was an acute situation, so I'm sure you weren't able to do a lot of stuff. But I, I completely agree. I was looking at that and just seeing color everywhere. I, I couldn't figure out what was what. <laughs> I was just going to echo. I mean, this is an amazing case, right? You guys did an amazing job. But sometimes you go into these cases and you just don't know how it's going to pan out, right? So there's a lot of things that you might do in retrospect. And you say, oh, I would have done this or I would have done that. But you're in that moment and you are just trying to figure out what the anatomy is sometimes. And, um, you know, we're always very lucky to have amazing imagers to help us. But multimodality makes such a difference. Um, sometimes I do find as everybody said, like the coaxiality for deploying the second part of the disc is a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you had a lot of equipment in the neck, so I don't think going through the IJ was going to be an option, but it does help for that second disc. No question having, having like a buddy wire 
or something. Is anybody using deflectible catheters to deploy devices like this? Because I think that can help with the coaxiality issue too. Like a, if you had like a 12 French OSCOR or something like that, maybe it would allow it. Sure, yeah. Yeah, um, has anybody else tried direct RV puncture for this VSD closures? So we, we've, done, uh, we've done a few now where, because the coaxiality thing is just a bear. I had one case where we, we trashed the tricuspid valve doing all the maneuvers. It was very frustrating, got the hole closed, but left the patient with terrible TR. So uh, we did, we just, it's very easy. You have to do a sternotomy. But you, you, with imaging, you can go right across the de from the defect and do a direct RV puncture off pump, of course, and then just jerry rig an amplatzer device. You know, cut the. Sh you know, you're only working with this much length, so you just cut everything, and very easy to deploy. And um, I do think it's a nice solution for, especially these uh, defects that are not just smack dab in the middle of the of the ventricular septum. They just tend to be tougher. It's a great case. Um, I had actually a case sim similar. It was a, a uh, it was an apical VSD post infarct, and I had the same issue where the the second disc wouldn't deploy, and the coaxiality can be a real problem. We've done some sort of direct punctures, but one option that worked in this case was we did transeptal and came down from the LV, and just that sort of different angle was enough to make it work. So that's that's just an, an, another option to consider. But you got a great result. Yeah, absolutely. That that makes a lot of sense. Is the is the IJ axis, you know, because they the Amplatzer makes the 180 curve, which is really made for the neck, and can work very well for apical defects. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. So this is a 68-year-old guy. Um, he had an infarct probably about a week before he came to us, um, had an inferior STEMI, which was missed. Um, his comorbidities include hypertension, diabetes, pretty bad hep C cirrhosis, and um, you know when he was being worked up, found to have COVID, pneumonia, fever. Um, it's really not the best substrate to begin with. So this was his in initial sort of pictures that we, we had in his initial eval. So went to the lab, um, you know, the left system looks okay, the right is occluded. It was occluded probably a week or two before, so that was not intervened on. And then he had this huge, you know, hole at the base of his septum, unfortunately. Um, so we were asked to consider percutaneous closure, and you know, I, I told them it's, it's quite basal, it's probably not a good idea to um, try and close this. So after a heart team discussion, he went for high risk, kudos to the surgeons, they took him for high risk surgery, um, even though he was cirrhotic, COVID positive. He did pretty well, post-op day 15, um, surprised one of the surgeons had a stethoscope, he heard, <laughs> heard a loud murmur and um, you know, he was, the patient was having trouble with diuresis, and that sort of prompted a physical exam, uh, did an echo, and, you know, this is what we were, uh, this is now post-op day 16. So what probably had happened was whether it sutured the, the graft, uh, the patch, the, the suture may have ripped, and now, you know, the transcatheter gods gave us a, a sort of an ideal uh, location for a, for a VSD. So we, uh, we had the luxury of time. He was, he was stable. I mean, he was developing some cardiorenal syndrome. Um, you know, you, we got this MRI because his creatinine wasn't the best, just to sort of understand what rims we're dealing with. Um, so as you can see, you know, this four-chamber view and this short-axis view. Uh, the defect was about 1.8 centimeters. Um, we were a little concerned that one, at least three rims were good. That posterior sort of rim wasn't the best, but I think three rims were good. So we said, you know, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and, and, and probably can do something for this. So the challenge was he had a recurrent VSD, torn surgical patch, or, or suture line tear. He's now prohibitive risk for surgery. 
Uh, he's pretty young. Uh, palliation was option A, and then option B was some sort of salvage percutaneous closure. Um, this was his op note, so the surgeons put a 4x4 bovine patch and put an eight interrupted uh, mattress sutures, and I'm assuming one of the sutures uh, probably tore. So, um, so this is what we did. Got him to the lab, GATE. Um, I got an A arterial line, uh, sorry, an uh, arterial axis with a seven French destination terumo, and I put in a 14 French dry seal in the groin. The, my rationale for that was um, I knew that the largest delivery sheet um, for these post infarct devices is 12, and I just wanted to uh, have some room so that I could, you know, I wouldn't have to go bareback. Um, so that was one. Number two, we started off with an LAO cranial projection uh, with contrast just to sort of see uh, where that defect was, but, you know, we had a pretty good uh, imaging support. So um, next step, we, so through the, uh, you know, Cross this defect pretty easy actually with a JR4 diagnostic and a soft angle glide wire. Um, at this point, for whatever reason, we just couldn't get to the IVC, couldn't get to the PA, but we were able to get into the SVC. It's a little unorthodox, sort of a little orthodox position, but we just took it in the SVC and we, we had our snare up ready. Um, so we snared in the SVC, created our rail. And, you know, this is actually, if, if you're doing this, Abbott has a very nice app uh, that I always refer to on, on my phone. So, so these, first of all, these post-infarct devices, you can't just purchase them from Abbott. You, you need to get an IRB approval. So they can't just show up to your door with the defects unless you use a congenital device. Um, the congenital device, I think the, the largest size, I would say, is an 18. Uh, these defects go from 16 to 24. Um, their discs are also larger in these defects compared to the congenital defects. So again, you probably need more anchor because you don't know what kind of tissue quality there is. So we decided up front that we'll definitely use a post-infarct device. Uh, we fortunately had that on our shelf. And we wanted to use a, even though our defect was about 18, we wanted to be oversized. So we used a 22 device that would give us 32 rims on either side. So uh, this is our 12 French. Um, Trevisio sheath that that we uh, took up through the uh, through the venous access and you know it's interesting here if you've done this operator two sort of gives you counter tension and pulls as operator one pushes up so um, and this is sort of the move the maneuver is operator one is pushing operator two is pulling and then you sort of get up the aortic valve you have to be fast here because you know VSD and acute AI is the recipe for um, disaster so. We were pretty quick. We started unsheathing our disc just near the LVOT so that we don't interact with the, with the mitral cords. And um, as you can see, we're slowly making progress. At this time, I don't have all the pictures, but you'll see the disc, interestingly, you know, you look at the picture to the left and then picture to the right. So I knew we were making contact with the septum. At this point, um, we had no MR, and then we went ahead, and the release is uh, the picture number three. Um, so did a good Minnesota wiggle. <laughs> this is a good tag. Make sure that uh, everything's in position. And as you'd seen, you know, from the last case, what what I had done was I retained a rail uh, in case I had to go back. And that is, it, I was able to do that because I had a 12 uh, guide. Even though I think you can deploy this device to a 10 guide, so I just retained my rail. I, I didn't have to. I was skeptical about putting an over eight safety wire because. You can't see it, and I was worried it may get kinked or, or caught with the device. So this is what things look like, image number two, and then um, this was that. Now, uh, you know, fortunately, the, 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 you know, the defect was sealed, but like Dr. Giardi mentioned, you know, unfortunately, we had TR, and there was nothing I could do about this. Um, it's a good, moderate to severe. The RV is so cordial rich that if you're putting a big device there um, and you know doing the way you're doing it, I don't think there's any way to avoid it. Um, so I think some some important points uh, that I learned. Number one, timing. This is a question that comes up all the time. You know, should we close them today or should we close them in three days? Let the tissue heal up. Let some fibrosis happen. So that's always a dilemma. Dilemma two is, you know, device sizing. Do you size one to one? Do you want to size two millimeters up, four millimeters up? 
Um, delivery also, you know, most cases you probably just go anti-grade through the IVC, but sometimes you can go retrograde. Theoretically, you have more control. If you go retrograde down the aorta, you could control how you release the right disc first and then uh, release your left disc. Uh, I think it's important to maintain a rail or have a safety wire like we discussed in the last case. And to be honest, I think in these cases, some degree of PR is probably just collateral damage. I don't see how we can avoid it with such, such large discs. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. That was a great case, uh, staged repair of a VSD, um, and as you said, you, the second position more favorable. I, I'm glad you showed this case because this whole issue of tricuspid valve or uh, tricuspid valve apparatus injury with these VSD procedures is not uncommon. And, and you talk to people who do this, right? I mean, they see it. And, and so how can we minimize that? Uh, in, in your case, it was interesting. You had to actually traverse the entire valve and get to the SVC. So it's conceivable that the wire somehow went between the cords, you know, on its way to the SVC. Um, but even going um, across the LV to the RV to the PA, I mean, you can hook the moderator band, and, and we've seen moderator bands get sliced in half. Um, you can hook some of the, you know, so maybe, you know, we need to be, once we create the rail wire, really pause and look at imaging and, you know, look at the TEE and really put some tension on the wire and see are we distorting anything in the tricuspid valve. I, I, you're right, I don't know how we prevent it. It seems like it should be an avoidable problem. I mean, we would, we, in a lot of cases, we'll, you know, for mitral, we use a balloon tip catheter to cross and we floss with the balloon tip catheter to make sure we're not trapped in any cords. Maybe we need some, some I don't know if that's possible. I don't think the catheters are long enough or to do that, but how, how can we prevent this problem? So can I say something? So I actually had another case after this, maybe I'll show it next year. <laughs> so after I learned from this, I, um, so I snared for that case was a post myectomy VSD. So I snared in the PA, you know, thinking what could I do this time? That didn't help. And then I, um, you know, I, I did rapid pacing. So I said, maybe I can rapid pace and move my leaflets higher up away from the septum. That didn't work either. So again, I, I just, these were just two things I tried and um, I didn't have much luck in them. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I would want to get people's opinions. <clears throat> I'm wonder I didn't see how far you pulled back the disc from, but I'm wondering if there's any way on imaging where you can not pull it back from as far away. I, I don't know if that would have solved the issue here, because as we know, there are septal cords uh, that sit right there. But just thinking out loud on how the imaging could have guided the case um, more favorably. I, I, I totally agree with all the points that have been made. Um, you have to assume in these cases, I, I think it was an amazing case, by the way. You. But you have to assume in every one of these cases that you're going to distort one of the valves, and there's going to be some trouble. So pausing along the way, once you create a rail, um, trying to floss, use a sizing balloon, something bulky, something, run it through and see, watch under imaging while it's happening. Um, we do try to be very conscious about not opening such a large disc so far from the defect, but it's a balance, right? You don't want to lose access. Um, very, very smart to have a buddy wire. Um, I think the point that was made about using a really large sheath is incredibly important because you may ultimately find it's good that you had a buddy wire, but you may find that the de that the disc the system that you used was not big enough. And you don't want to have to start over. So being able to then go and upsize, right? So so if you have a range in your mind of the of the um, devices you might use, use the sheet that's going to accommodate the largest and maybe even a little bigger than what you think you're going to use, because you may find yourself having to go down that path too. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And I think these patients are the sickest. And, you know, once they go under GA, their SVR drops, and then, you know, the clock just sticks because the pressures are going to go up. And I think often you just have one shot. So you're right. I mean, take your largest guide and probably oversize your device um, just so that you can do it in one go. 
Yeah, I think in, in this case, I think it was great, again, um, echoing what other people have said as far as having the rail. I think when we have patients this sick, oftentimes we're like, oh, we got a cross, we got a disc, and you know, we're just happy with that. And I think a lot of times we've just been like, okay, well, we're sacrificing the tricuspid valve. That's fine. This patient, we've now fixed the, the VSD. But I think now that you know, we know more outcomes with tricuspid regurgitation, I think you, know, you have a stable patient taking that time um, in order to not just you know, sacrifice their tricuspid valve and figure out out whether or not um, there are ways that we can adjust our wire um, in order to not just sacrifice the tricuspid valve. The other thing is the um, muscular VSD device that you used, those are often unsatisfying in adults because the <coughs> waist length on that is seven millimeters. And you know, most people, their interventricular septum's a centimeter, right? And most adults or more. Uh, so you get into the issue, and th so those were really designed really for kids. Um, and so you get in the situation with where, where like you had, or the other case, um, where where the the left disc deploys, but then the right disc gets trapped in the in the in the septal tissue, and it doesn't expand. So one trick is to actually upsize a couple sizes, because what will happen is, if you if if the waist is not fully expanded, the, the entire device actually elongates, and the discs move farther apart. So if you have, say, like a, you know, an 18 waist, if it's only going to 12, then the two discs spread further. So that, that's one way to span it uh, or use a post-infarct device. You know, that's a new trick. I, I fortunately had the post-infarct device, which has a 10 waist, so we got lucky. Next up, Paul Saraja. Great case, Yash. Thank you. Thankfully. So, um, um, my disclosures. So I'm going to share with you this interesting case. Um, I can't say that it was the hardest one that I've ever done. Well, I would say it's actually one of the hardest ones. It was hard. So uh, um, actually, I don't know, is Caitlin Acostas? You, you might remember this case. Yeah, you, yeah. It was hard, wasn't it? OK, there you go. All right. <laughs> so um, this is a 71-year-old uh, woman, and she's got a pseudoaneurysm. So it was interesting. So she had a TAVR done, and then she got endocarditis. And then she uh, got that explanted and had an aortic root repair. And I want to hear Gaurav's take on this too. So then she had a small residual pseudoaneurysm just postoperatively near the aorta mitral uh, curtain. And then um, a month afterwards, uh, she had a CT scan that showed some enlargement. So this is uh, what we see. And on the left-hand side, you can see the TE image. And it was actually kind of hard to, hard to get at and appreciate. I think the initial image, if I remember correctly, actually assumed it was something else. But then the CT scan, uh, you can see here, there's a pretty good pseudoaneurysm right underneath the aorta. And <clears throat> it's going from RV to somewhere else. What's that space, Gaurav? <laughs> probably, uh, probably by the transverse. By the transverse sinus, OK. Underneath the aorta by the transverse sinus. What was that, Jason? Yeah, so this is the mouth, and then this is the pseudoaneurysm right there. And on the T, you can see it right here. See this pulsating thing? And I think that was, so it was, it was, it was interesting, right? Yeah, so the aortic valve is somewhere over here. You can't quite see it. You might, so the short axis would be like right here. So if you take this, so take this image, this is the aorta, this is the entrance, and this is the pulsating mass, and then the tricuspid valve is right here. Prior taver, explanted, and then ha has this. I mean, the location of this defect is very concerning given its proximity to the tricuspid valve. Yes. Um, so that will present some challenges. Thank you. <laughs> Where were you? Okay. 
All right, so, uh, so the clinical challenge is, is how to close this. Okay, so here's, here's an RV gram, and you can see uh, the surgical valve there. And if you just watch carefully here, see this pulsating thing? Did you say God? Not available at the moment. Um, so uh, right here is this pulsating thing. <laughs> okay, so how, how to close this? And I'll, I'll, I'll step you through this. And this is one of those ones, okay, I, I share these things so that you can learn from my pain because um, what we did is we spent a long time. This is the uh, um, Inagilis, a JR4, and then you can see basically this is a combination, the only combination I could find that could get anything close to the defect. And the challenge here was that we had catheters going in this direction, and then catheters going in this direction. And then any time you push, you're pushing this direction. And so we had competing directions. Andrew? Are, I'm just looking at the screen. Are those some kind of stabilization wires in the RV that are? Um, uh, stabilization wires? Um, there's like a loop coming around. Do you have extra wires holding your sheath so These that you can then? Wires? Uh, no. No, okay. No. I was just no. wondering if you could like get some kind of anchor to <laughs> yeah. ke keep the sheath in place. Um, no, and so, you know, we started with an angle tip glide because, you know, that's what I typically cross my PVLs with, but the angle tip glide, every time I push it, it would defect the catheters one way or the other. And then, so then I switched to the corny wire, which I really like because it's just like crossing a, a, a corny lesion. It's, it's super soft and can be put in there. Yes, Jason. But, but, I mean, what is, what is your strategy? Are you trying to build coils? Are you trying to I haven't even got there yet. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah. To get enough support to actually track a device in there, wow, I don't, I don't know that that's possible. So the plan was to hopefully get a guide in and put an AVP2, in all honesty. And, you know, I, these pseudorandoms, as we know, if, if they're not 100% closed, then you, if you got the tiniest leak, one blood cell, uh, one red blood cell, they'll stay open. And so we had to get complete closure, whatever we did. Yeah. Oh. What was the next sign? No, no symptoms, except this is getting bigger. That's what I'm starting to think about. And where's, is that deer here this morning? No, she's not. Well, she, she um, this was three hours into the case, because nothing would pass. And she's like, Paul, WTF, you know, what do we do next? And so basically, what I conclude is that there was just no support because of this accordion. It was just according over and over again. And, and so what we did, I took a 12 French uh, Oscar Destino, and so this, this is a really great catheter. And so if, if you haven't had this, but it's got curve retention because the Agilis, every time you push things, it unwinds. It just comes undone. And the accordion kept coming undone. I reduced the, the catheter's uh, curve as much as possible because that S curve was, was the problem. I use a coronary wire. And then over that coronary whisper wire, I use a Rubicon. And the Rubicon goes over that and then through the Rubicon, you can tell, start telescoping things. You, basically, it's like doing a CTO. You keep everything soft and then escalate gradually. And then once that's inside, then we place the safari. Okay, so this is how. Oh, the, yes. The other, and, and what you're seeing here is that it always makes you nervous when you start escalating the wire support because you presumably you're in a pseudo aneurysm. Yes. And you know, with the, we've done this with aortic pseudo aneurysms with strange angles where you kind of escalate. And I'm always worried that because that's what a pseudo aneurysm. There's no yeah. wall. Right? There's it's, no wall. Will the, your safari wire just go in the pericardium or something? It's well, very nervous. That's what I was asking. But. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's already a rupture. Okay. So this is how it works. So see the Oscar? Here's the Oscar Destino. 
The JR4 is pointed this direction. Now look how straight this is. Okay, so it's very important to keep this as straight as possible. The whisper wire is inside, and if you watch carefully, you'll see the Rubicon come over that. So there's a Rubicon, and it's sliding out there. Thank goodness for Flora Save. Okay, so there's, and this is the position here. And then once that Rubicon is in, it's, it was amazing. God answered, and the JR4 slid over the Rubicon. I was actually shocked by that because I was prepared to put the safari through the Rubicon. But I'll tell you, I didn't show you the two hours of work before this because when I had gotten another catheter in here, in here, every time I put the safari in, everything whipped out. Everything backed out because of the, the pigtail nature of the safari, which is incredibly frustrating. So, so that's how it works. So then the JR uh, is in here. And then it, it actually went pretty quickly. So once the JR was in, then we're able to get the safari far inside. And then over that safari, then it becomes just like any PVL closure. Flexor sheets, 90 centimeter. And the A French flexor comes right over that. And finally, we get somewhere. And then here's a, a 16 AVP2. And then here's the, uh, the defect. And luckily, to Angie's point, we had spent three hours at this point, and I was beginning to think, you know what, if I ding that tricuspid valve, I'm not going to care. <laughs> I, I see but, that you had um, T and ice as well. Did you need the ice imaging to, to look at this part of the tricuspid Yeah, valve? because we actually didn't know which one would give us the imaging we needed, so we had both. Uh, but it turned out that it was all uh, T. So. so that was that. And then this is the final release, and this is an RV gram. And then what's incredibly gratifying is you start to see this flow stagnation happening. Uh, you know, in retrospect, should I put coils here or not? You know, honestly, I, I really thought about it, um, and I kind of regret not putting at least some because I think that these close better with coils. But my concern is that if I started putting coils in here and I didn't get the mouth closed, that it would be a big problem. I'd never be able to get back in, because I would never have the wire support to get back across. What was your max size of the neck? What was the, the, like? the neck of the pseudoaneurysm? Uh, I think it was like six or eight, and okay. usually I'd double. You know, when yeah, because um, we, we, I've had one bad experience with coils where they actually started coming out with yes. a large neck pseudoaneurysm. So I'm always nervous about Did you retrieve coils. them, or what did you do with that? Partially retrieved, <laughs> partially, <laughs> partially left in, partially and partially a little bit out of the neck. Okay, so not not ideal. Well, we can talk about some quality of that sometime. Okay, all right. So, that, but, that's, can I ask? On the, uh, that's this is incredible, Paul. Great case. Um, when you uh, when you pulled when you deployed the AVP, I mean, one concern is that as you pull back to the the neck, that the whole thing just then flips down to the RV. And so was there a sequence that you deploy? How did you deploy it and pull it back and, and sort of not have it all come out? Yeah, we just, we just went super slow. Um, let me see if I actually can play this. Let's see here, I think, oh yeah, sorry. No, I already deployed it here at this point. But we, d we just went super slow. But I wanted most of the device obviously in the defect because I didn't want this to hang out and, and cover the tricuspid valve. I mean, you can see right there. And I think Nadir actually yelled yipes or something uh, just to say, look, you, you missed the tricuspid valve, thank goodness. So. Um, and this is nice here because it looks like the pseudoaneurysm is already getting smaller here. That's amazing. I can't tell that, but thank you. Well, now you see <laughs> so, the aortic. You are here, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Well, it's certainly not pulsating like it used to, right, Vivian? Here. Yeah. So, so it, I mean, you're it's certainly. You're able to see the aortic valve clear now. I don't know if that's just the angulation of the TE probe or whether or not. It's a good, good question. Yeah, you do see the aortic valve a little bit better. But anyway, so um, key points. Um, so I, I didn't talk about this a whole lot, but Omar and, and others, I mean, CT, we use CT for all of our PVL planning. It gives us the angles, it gives us the entrance, and we just set the eye to that angle, and then we find it uh, on the CT. 
Uh, I recommend using steerable catheters that have ratchets because, you know, to manage an agilis, when you're passing stiff things through the agilis, it just unwinds itself, and it's really frustrating, especially if you spend a lot of time getting there. I like the soft wire approach with escalation. I've done this a lot more now instead of starting with the angle glide because the, glide cat, the angle glide uh, wire also will undo things because of its stiffness. And then, you know, for these really difficult multiple curves, really think about, you know, just doing whatever you can to minimize that and make it straight. I think I appreciate Mark Rashardi's point about puncturing the RV and such and the comment earlier about going uh, uh, apical as well. I think that that's something we could have considered if we couldn't make this S turn. So, thank you very much. Yeah, I think um, the CT for these is absolutely critical. I mean, it, sa it just saves you so many headaches in, in understanding the anatomy before going in. Um, and especially with these ones that we've seen, uh, these VSDs and pseudoaneurysms that, you know, these are not simple anatomies. They're very complex and it's, it's tough to understand in a case um, with just the echo and the fluoro exactly where everything falls. And the, the point, deployment views are so non-standard. We're not thinking about these angles and they're unique to every patient, right? So unless you want to burn through 100 cc's of contrast to figure it out, I couldn't agree more. I mean, using the CT to guide. All right, we'll move on. Great, great case, Paul. Um, next speaker, Stephen Little. Okay, guys, well, thanks uh, for the invitation. Paul, Jason, it's great to be here. Uh, title I was given was an imaging safe, so it's tough to pick a case because really they're all saved by imaging. <laughs> uh, disclosures, none, so we'll go on. So the, the case presentation is really short. It's a 73-year-old woman. She's got severe MAC, um, in and out of hospital with heart failure, evaluated by the surgeons. Surgeons said, no, thank you. Uh, CT demonstrated the MAC went all the way down into the LV. So really the discussion point is, um, you know, she's got a predominant stenosis based on MAC. You can see the images. I like to show this one because it really doesn't matter if it plays or not. It looks about the same. And, uh, you know, the mean gradient measured by the fellow, 10.5. So I would call that 11. So that's severe stenosis. So the discussion point is, um, you know, what can we do about this? Um, this is the idea. Can we stick a sapien transeptal into the MAC? Uh, it's amazing, you know, how at this conference now we keep seeing this presented as it's very routine now. Uh, it still doesn't feel routine when you're engaged in these conversations. So the idea is, can we do this safely? What happens next? So as you've heard, we uh, evaluate LVOT obstruction. You know, this is sort of the basics. Uh, you've got to be greater than, than uh, 200 millimeters squared. Uh, for this particular patient, CT planning said she was going to be very small. So significant risk of LVOT obstruction by just putting the sapien in the MAC. So we did what uh, increasingly is done, which is a base-to-tip lampoon. Um, so this is, again, yesterday somebody commented on, you know, the routine use of this lampoon procedure, which is kind of amazing to, to think that this is now routine. Uh, we've only been doing it for about a year, and it just, not a single one of these cases yet feels routine. Uh, but this is how it's done, uh, 3D guided. We do basically everything in 3D and X-plane. You can see on the bottom right, this is where uh, catheter 2 is being positioned at the base of the antimitral leaflet. Catheter 1 is across the orifice. This is sort of the, the positioning uh, sequence. Here they are, positioned 1 and 2, the idea of, of tearing from one to the other. Uh, this is sort of demonstration that we've got the perforation in the right spot. Uh, base of A2, that's the other defect. And then, of course, the uh, flying V is created. You can see the MAC. This one is the, the money shot where everything gets pulled, the slice is made, and things are going reasonably well so far. Uh, sapient deployment, um, everything looks about right there. This is the final result on the right. I'm an echo guy, so I'm kind of showing these thorough things, but I don't know what this all means. But there's the, there's the fluoro sapiens in the right spot. Okay, so these are the much more important echo images. And uh, you can see, so now we've got a mean diastolic gradient of one. Uh, you can see here, you know, the LVOT looks okay so far. These are gonna play. And then this is kind of what happens. You have, not surprisingly, a, an oval-shaped or a non-circular MAC. You put a circular device into it. Not uncommonly, you get a little PVL. So, so far, things are going okay. We have one millimeter gradient, we have mild PVL. 
Um, going back to sort of the before and after, we have before on the left, after on the right, sort of summarizing some of the things that have happened here. You know, this is what we're doing in 2023, multimodality imaging, CAT, CT, ultrasound. Uh, we didn't actually show it. We did some DASI simulations for the digital deformation, trying to figure out what will be the NEO-LVOT and how will this valve sit. Real-time 3D guidance, catheter-based electrosurgery, and a beating heart implantation. So this is now the routine. Um, you know, this is one of the discussion points, and this is not an uncommon scenario. So now we have PVL. Uh, we have a left-to-right shunt through our uh, iatrogenic septostomy that we all made. And this is sort of the discussion point where we pause is, is this a PVL that we need to close? Because you've got LV to uh, LA pressure, so five meter jet. You've got hard stuff on one side, you've got hard stuff on the other side, so that's a red blood cell blender. Uh, and you've got a small hole, so it's high velocity. So reasonable risk for hemolysis, but at this point, things are going well. We're, we're gonna leave that alone right now, and we'll evaluate the patient and see what happens. So. We've got a little hole, we've got a shunt in the right direction. There's our summary. Uh, it's all feeling pretty good in the cath lab. So we kind of feel like it's a Disney finish. The princesses are happy and the birds are singing and nobody's high-fiving because that's bad luck, but we're all feeling good. Um, patient goes home uh, two days, so success, feels great. Family's very happy, but if it was like that, they wouldn't be presenting it. So this is actually a little more to the story. It transitions to a full Stephen King finish. So two months later, now she's back, she's in clinic, she's less happy, and we have this scenario. So what has happened is the PVL has uh, uh, increased enormously. You could perhaps appreciate that the valve is now a little tilted. So whether it's a recoil, whether it's an atrial displacement, whether it's just a funky tilt. Um, so now we have to go back and, and consider some other options. So we're in the, uh, the hybrid OR. And the thinking is we can plug this. So this is an AVP2 uh, deployment. that will fast forward to this point. It was actually a fairly quick uh, crossing, uh, much more so than expected. We used the transeptal that had, hole that had already been there. So this is ongoing now, and uh, things are looking up again. Uh, not at that point, no, uh, because the hole was too big. You're right. Yeah, that's, that's the nice thing. So you transition from hemolysis to heart failure. Uh, <laughs> Right, so we, we, the risk was not realized yet. So we've got the, uh, the plug deployed, and you know, at first we're thinking things are okay. This is perhaps the imaging save, if you wanted to call it that. When you see the plug, you see it's, it's sort of in the mid-flow area. It's not over here where it should be. Um, so we are definitely in the LV, but how did the plug get there, and where is the plug? So this is what, you know, the sapien is there. That's the frame to say where we are. We were trying to go entirely paravalvular, and likely what happened is we sort of crossed. At some point, you got it halfway across, and because it's open cell, you cross a cell, and now the plug is obstructing the inflow instead of being paravalvular, it's really in the midst of flow. So uh, not the outcome we really wanted. Um, so we're, we're sort of recognizing this and thinking about this and fussing a little more with the PVL plugging. Exactly. So it, it may be very hard to, and that's one of our lessons, it may be very hard to stay entirely para frame. Yeah, maybe. Um, so Steve, in the, um, in the slide where you showed the PVL <clears throat> originally, it, it actually looked like it was going from inside uh, the valve through the cell and then yeah. exiting the atrium, which is the path that you're... You're, uh, you're right. So the, took. I guess the question is, would it be okay to deploy somewhere, but then they've got the, the plug in the frame, not in the defect. So it's, it's a challenging thing to do, and this is probably the first time we've really experienced the challenges of, of THV in MAC plugging. Um, so we're going a little further, and the, the patient... It doesn't yeah. look like it's the leaflet is striking, even though the, 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 the plug is within the uh, frame. Yeah. It, it, was, it was hitting, and the mean gradient had gone up a little bit. It was, you know, it was hard to tell because there was still some regurgitation flow, but the mean gradient had gone up a couple of points. So there were some indicators that it was obstructing the transcatheter heart valve function, uh, the diastolic function. The only other thing I would say is um, these defects are often very serpiginous, right? And, it, and there may be a defect that measures four millimeters here and eight millimeters there. Um, 
to the point that was made earlier, if you oversize aggressively, the middle part of those AVP2s can stretch out quite a bit yep. and, pro and lengthen the distance between one disk and the other. Yep. And I had a case like this not too long ago where we realized that we were overhanging in a similar way and obstructing the mitral inflow and um, just deploying a smaller device allowed us to shorten the length of the, of the AVP2 and that, that helped tremendously. Okay, that's interesting. Um, but in this case, it sounds like you're concerned that you're through, a, um, through the stent, which is different. Yeah, no, I think yeah, we, yeah. Were, we were definitely through the cell and we were obstructing the, uh, the inflow. Um, yeah, Jason. I mean, at this point, you're just trying to get out of dodge, um, but if it is, I don't know if we can go back and look at that, but if it yeah. is in fact hitting the leaflet, right, that's, that's very, very bad because the patient will develop an erosion in the leaflet and a hole in the leaflet eventually. Back, go back one more. I would think so. I mean, one one option would be to, at this point, if that happened, would be to deploy another sapien inside this sapien to kind of. <clears throat> oh yeah, so that, the, just the tip is. Maybe that'll be okay. It's making uh, contact, but you know, and over time, generally those erode and, and form. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this was also early, relatively early in the procedural day, so we're thinking, well, we don't like this yet. We're going to see if we can fix it. Um, You'd be worried size, about what size plug was that? Do you remember? I don't recall. I don't recall. Yeah. I mean, that I mean, you have to think about what if you're going to retrieve this, you have to put your delivery catheter through the cell to get to. Yeah. It, which and that, you know that valve is just barely hanging on the anterior annulus there. I mean, yeah, if yeah. it if it enters the LV even a couple millimeters, the whole thing looks like it would just. Yeah, so you could easily tilt that prosthesis in the wrong way going through the. With the retrieval. Probably putting another valve in at this point. So the, not a the great retrieval idea. actually wasn't too challenging. So the, the thought process at this point is we're going to retrieve this, we're going to reposition this, we're going to try again to, to stay trans or para, uh, trans catheter heart valve frame as much as it's possible. Um, again, it went surprisingly easy to this point, which is probably why it was so easy, because it was in the wrong place. Um, so fast forward this again. So at this point, the patient's uh, you know, fully, deeply sedated and appears very comfortable. The anesthesiologist is getting increasingly agitated and is saying that things are looking bad. They, uh, it's getting more difficult to oxygenate, uh, blood pressure is falling, and, and what are you guys doing, and what's going on? Um, so we see now that the left to right shunt has become mixed, but predominantly now right to left. So something's changing, despite uh, plugging or attempted plugging of the PVL. And then when we look at 3D, we see that our catheters, guide catheters that are fussing over here with the paravalvular plugging, are basically holding open the iatrogenic ASD flap that had been created by the septostomy two months earlier. So all of the hardware is actually effectively reversing our shunt. And this is happening over and over again. So, you know, we weren't really paying a lot of attention to what's happening at the shunt level. We were focused on the valve. Um, but patient is getting worse and worse, and hemodynamics are getting worse, and we're sort of saying, well, the MR is not worse. What's, what's going on? And then sort of full-blown gets to this point, and this is our four chamber, and this is really to show you the, what's happening with the flow. So now we have full on right to left shunts, a lot of PVL. We have retrieved the plug. RV function's worse, TR's function is worse. So, so TR is now severe and basically blowing into the LA almost directly. Um, and this is all a consequence of just hypoxia, increased PA pressure, worsening RV function, RV dilation, subsequent TR, and there's this sort of a cycle of doom. Um, basically from holding open the ASD. So this is sort of our, our, our summary at this point. Um, we are realizing with, you know, systolics of 80 and worsening oxygenation that uh, an anesthesiologist is getting more and more agitated, uh, that we should probably do something else. So this was a helical ASD occluder, try to fight another day, uh, and get out of there and, and save the patient in the moment. Um, so a lot of lessons for us from the imaging perspective and, and the interventional perspective. So valve and MAC it certainly remains very challenging. The lampoon procedure can certainly preserve the LVOT flow area, and that was one of the issues that actually wasn't a concern. The LVOT was fine. Um, PVL after MAC is actually quite common because it's not a circle in a circle, typically, so you have irregular shapes that don't really want to match up well. Uh, we've got to respect, increasingly, the large iatrogenic ASD, and remember to keep an eye on it. Uh, the PVL repair beside a transcatheter heart valve is challenging. The frame was more complex than a surgical valve. And then finally, I remember fondly when Mac was the surgeon's problem. <laughs> we didn't have to do any of this. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you.
Thanks for sharing that incredible case. So, I mean, do you think closing that little PVL the first time might have made a difference, or is this just going to happen inevitably from remodeling or I, yeah. or recoil uh, or what have you? I think at first, and you know, the first few days she was doing very well, and I think it seemed like the right move. I think the magnitude of the change of the PVL, uh, it's probably a good thing we didn't plug it because it just got substantially bigger. So I think the, the valve moved or something recoiled, or I think there was, there was an anatomic change between day zero and month two. Uh, I'm not sure, quite sure what it was. So looking back at the CAT scan, do you think that there was anything that you could have predicted as far as placement of the um, transcatheter valve um, that could have prevented it from moving, like it, putting it in a more stable position? Um, was there anything in retrospect? I think this is the frontier of valve and MAC. Um, every case is different. Every patient's different. I don't think we know enough about how the calcium deforms or doesn't deform or where it's going to deform. Um, also, when you've you know, split the anterior leaflet, you've, you've changed the landing zone. Uh, so it's very hard to know. You've, that's a dramatic change to the front. So what's going to happen at the back? If you know, if you, maybe we should have done less of a lampoon if there had been the hard surface to push against. The contact posteriorly might have been stronger. So and, you know, in a post lampoon era, it's I think yeah. there's so much unknown here. So I hope to come back in a year or two and share more cases that don't end like this. Yeah. So the <clears throat> so the Mac, for the max score, part of it is is the leaflet calcium. Yeah. But when you're now doing a lampoon and you're changing that metric uh, because you no longer have that portion of the anchoring. So I, I think, to me, it looks like that's probably part of what happened at least. Yeah, it's a very acute change in geometry mid-case, so it's difficult to plan that. All right. Okay, thank Stephen, you. thank you so much. Thanks, that was Steve. fantastic. Um, we have a nice segue to that talk, which is uh, Andrew Rassi is going to talk to us about his ultimate structural case involving plugs. Okay, so um, thanks as always for inviting me to be here. Um, you're going to see a lot of similarities actually between the last case and this one, but I think that one was better actually. Um, where's the clicker? Here it is. All right, cool. So I don't have any relevant financial disclosures for this talk. Um, this is a 79-year-old man who comes to the office. He's got recurrent mitral regurgitation. You'll see on the transthoracic here lots of, lots of MR, coando effect. He's had a prior surgical repair of his mitral valve. He had a 30-millimeter simulus semi-rigid ring, which is a complete um, semi-rigid. He also had a surgical aortic valve replacement. He had a thoracic aortic aneurysm repair um, and history of AFib. So he's class 3 heart failure. He's got an elevated STS score, and, and we're basically asked to evaluate him. So we start thinking immediately about doing a valve and ring. Um, just looking at the app, you get a sense that this is a non-fracturable, complete ring. Um, these are the dimensions. And then we're thinking about Neo-LVOT, so a lot of the same issues. Plenty of space uh, if we were modeling with the 29S3. Um, 442 is the Neo-LVOT. Um, however, one thing that we also think about is leaflet length, um, and I'd be curious to hear from others in the room, you know, whether you would consider doing a lampoon for anything over 25 millimeters. That's kind of become our practice. Um, so that's what we started to plan for. So our plan at this point is valve and ring, um, retrograde tip to base lampoon, and then see what happens. Um, one other interesting piece of information, though, I don't think I'm as good at looking at these CTs as some of our amazing imaging colleagues, but they did identify a potential defect, um, and they called it possibility of valve dehiscence, of ring dehiscence, rather. So let me just pause here, and I would ask, um, would this change anybody's plan as far as whether you would want to do a valve and ring? Well, you would need the T uh, correlate to this. Is there, in fact, flow through that? possible defect. Okay, perfect. So uh, you need more information, right? So this is, your, this is your TE, and I've only showed a couple representative images. I think they're probably the best images that we had. I will tell you, our imager spent a long time trying to figure it out. It does look like there's something there on the uh, medial. Yeah, this is not um, oriented correctly, right? So if we turn it all clockwise, like on the anterior, the left of the screen is the anterior in the 3D, and up top would be the septal. 
So, so you're thinking you see a little bit of flow through there, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I will just, I will out myself here and I will tell you that we were so focused on all of the MR that we saw that we totally ignored what I now see very clearly in retrospect, right? Um, we thought we had really, really evaluated things, but, but we clearly missed it. Um, Did you consider it here? I mean, is it an appropriate leaflet to be a part of the conversation? Um, it, it, uh, yes, we, we often do think about that as well. In this particular case, um, I actually am trying to remember back to the reason. I don't have enough of the to, I mean, grasping view to see if, if we thought there was enough leaflet to go after. I think the answer was that we didn't think there was. Just well, looks what like size the, ring was it? It's 30. a 30. 30, okay. So a little borderline, because you risk of stenosis would be significant with a, with a ring that small. There's already diastolic aliasing, and the entire coaptation plane is, is, it's not just one focal. Maybe it's just a torn cord, and you just put it in the side, you can do it. But something like this, it's going to be hard to make it less than one plus. Um, I think I think I think it was prolapse. Yeah, it looks like there's still there's a flail that's sort of beneath it. So was there a presumed anticipation before? Yeah. How did they repair it? Um, so I will be honest. This is my yeah. I th I think they did. I think they did partial resection, and I think they just did the um, the ring. The other question about I don't think they did any needle cords or anything. Although the ring is small, if it's a primary you know, defect, it's not functional, then the co-optation that you're going to create with the clip is actually, you know, it's a centimeter deeper. So it's not actually at the same plane as the ring. So it's, yeah. you really are, you're creating a sort of a two tunnel relationship. So, you know, we've gotten away with a lot of these clipping uh, because the clip is so, so far deeper than the ring. You still get, you get a gradient of three or four for sure, but uh, it's, it's part of the conversation, in, at least in trying to evaluate these cases. Is anybody worried about putting, I mean, it sounds like people are, is anybody worried about putting, putting a transcatheter heart valve in here knowing that there's potential dehiscence that's already existing? <coughs> and I've asked my surgeons, like, what, what does a dehiscence of a ring actually mean? It's very different than a dehiscence of a valve, right? Is, it, is, there, a, is there such a thing? Is it just a, a defect? Is it a suture that didn't go in? Or? Yes. So does those usually go back. are uh, a, lot, a bit more flexible? So, so a 30 millimeter stimulus, and um, this was you know based on the app, what our dimensions at least, are. At least the, and maybe there's a difference in nomenclature, but the, the, there are Medtronic stimuluses that are a little more pliant and actually will expand. Mm -hmm. You said this was not fracturable. This one was considered, they called it a semi-rigid, and on the app they're telling us it's not fracturable. Yeah. So we went ahead um, and we decided to go ahead and do this. Um, again, I will tell you in retrospect that I know the leak is there, but at the time we were feeling pretty good that there is no leak. Um, we did do retrograde tip to base lampoon. Um, so you see on the left screen, we're setting up our rail system and then we have our flying V and then there's the valve going in. And you know we were high-fiving ourselves, so that was a problem. Um, because our imager said, uh, hold on, not so fast, right? Again, very similar to the last case, um, this time in a ring as opposed to in Mac. Um, there's a little bit of central MR that you see on the left screen. I think it's catheter related from the pigtail because we were getting pressures. Um, but there's no question that there is leak adjacent to, let's call it the mitral implant. Um, and then we do an LV gram just because, why not? So what do you do here? Um, how would you treat this? The, the title of the talk is called Plug, so I think you know the answer. But would anybody um, want to hit this with a balloon as a first step? Because it's very tempting. No. Why, why do you think that would make it dry? What's, is there a harm in doing that? Is I, I think it's easier to put the plug across than balloon if you wanted to. Um, it just makes getting things across easier. I mean, presumably there was some shape change in the ring that made the 
leak open up. And so if you balloon it, you're just exaggerating that shape change. And so, it, it, I mean, it doesn't make sense that it would get better. It would, should get worse. Yeah. So that would be my, my thinking. So I'll show you the next picture, but this is the discussion point, right? Um, you know, some people in the room are saying, go ahead and hit this. You need to hit that. And we're like, no, 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 no. You've got to understand the anatomy, right? So first of all, is this a leak that is between the ring and the valve implant? Or is this a leak that is the perivalvular leak that you thought, or the peri-ring leak, right? And look at this. It looks bigger than it did in the baseline images. Granted, we didn't show it very well in the baseline images, but we certainly looked for it. And we don't have to look very hard now. And it looks pretty circular. It looks like it's expanded, right? I would completely agree. So we, we chose not to do that. Um, sizing these things are a challenge, right? I mean, it's very hard. This is taking up almost 25% of the circumference of the ring. Um, so measuring it, trying to figure out which device is going to work. We don't have AVP3s. Um, so on the right screen, you'll notice that the widest point of the defect was measuring about six millimeters. And then, you know, just roughly the, the length is going to be about 20 from top to bottom. So we're thinking also, you know, what kind of plugs can we use? Um, do we have anything that would actually work for this? And then we have to think about the challenge of how to cross it and how to deliver the equipment. And then it looks like there might be another jet in the middle screen here. And it's always very tough to know, are these things contiguous? Are they separate, right? I mean, presumably there's there's some degenerative disease in the medial commissure on, in the native valve that's, that's, that's creating this jet and that's just flowing between the ring and the annulus. So, you know, just thinking outside the box, could you, you know, probably not, but you could put a clip in there. Like you could, if you could fit a clip in there and clip the medial commissure, <laughs> that might solve it. The other thing would be interesting if you knew this was gonna happen, you know, to put a clip in the medial commissure before you did valve and ring to kind of shut off the medial commissure and then, you know, this wouldn't happen, but you, you wouldn't know, you didn't know this was gonna happen. Very interesting. Um, and then the same discussions, right? Like, do we go after this? Do we leave it alone? What is it that we're trying to do? Are we, are we plastic surgeons? Does this have to look perfect, right? Are we worried about hemolysis? Are we worried about heart failure, right? So I think the heart failure issue here is, is real, right? This is a big leak. There's a big V wave, I can tell you that. Um, I'm less worried about hemolysis in this particular case because I'm presuming this was already there beforehand and maybe I made it worse, but I don't think that's going to make hemolysis worse. I don't think it was that bad before. I agree. I think that there was a bit of a dehiscence. Of and the it, ring. Yeah. it wasn't probably that much a little bit, but when you circularize it and you can't, the valve doesn't expand fully because the ring is exceeding it. I think you've changed geometry and now that, that there is a, a space there that now could potentially open up. So, so I will tell you, there's a case that we did last week that is the identical case. It's the same, same semi-rigid, simulus, same, surgeon. same, same surgeon, unfortunately. Um, but that's not the issue here, I don't think. <laughs> um, and we had the exact same thing where on CT we saw what looked like a defect. And we, because of this experience, I mean, we spent like an hour. Like, there has to be a leak. There has to be a leak. Where is it? Where is it? We could not find it. We did the exact same thing. Boom. Giant leak, just like this. So, I mean, these are, these, I mean, it's got to be more dehiscence, right? I mean, I think so. I think we it's changed a, the geometry as initial, we circularized. And it's, and it's nothing exactly your fault. I mean, the tissue quality in the area dehissed, I mean, because it's, it's poor. And, and you're just unmasking what's there, which is poor tissue. Well, the other thing to consider is you've also taken away the easy MR option, which is up through the middle, right? So, yes. you know, the paravalvular defect is only going to open up as much as it has to. And if you've got central MR, so now you've taken that away, so all of the MR pressure has to go through this other hole. So the actual defect may not be changing, you just have more flow through it. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. So we did very similar strategy to what Paul did in his case, although his is way cooler because there were many more turns and angles. But we, I like a telescoping technique. Um, we use an Agari deflectible catheter here. That's nice because it goes bidirectional, not super essential for this particular case. Does it have a ratchet? I think it does, yeah, yeah. Um, it, I don't think it retains its shape as well as the Oscor does, but, but it, it, it seems to hold it better than an Agilis. Um, and then you put, I like to put the guide directly in. So I wanted an eight French guide because I knew that I could then deliver three wires 
three oh three five stiff wires through there. If you have a seven French guide or a six French guide, you can't do it. Then you got to like leapfrog and add two or three more steps to each procedure. Um, in through there, put the multi-purpose 125 diagnostic catheter and then our glide wire through there. And then I think the point that was made earlier is very, very valid. You have to be careful not to cross through the struts of this, of this transcatheter heart valve. Um, so we try to find a very coplanar view where we can get separation and we go through many steps to ensure that we're not through anything um, for the reasons that were mentioned. And once you have several wires in there, um, then you're kind of off to the races as long as you pick the right, right um, plug. So we, used, we decided to use AVP2s as well. Um, you see how the middle disc really can stretch, and that is what you get your seal from when you're doing something like this. The discs are there kind of to anchor a little bit, um, and I don't think those, that's what actually seals the defect. So um, we sized with the idea that we would have two of these side by side. Remember the dimensions were six wide, and I do like Paul, I just doubled it, so we picked 12 millimeter devices. And then I thought, well, if I stack two next to each other, hoping to create an arc of some kind, that takes me to 24, which is bigger than 20. And so we thought we would start there, but we did leave a wire in. So um, you'll notice that we like to deploy, if we're gonna do more than one device, I think most people do this, you wanna stay anchored to the devices, right? Because you never know what your final result is gonna be until you, until you release. You don't know if you're gonna push something out. I've had a case where the first device went in just fine, and then the second device actually squashed out the first device. So you really wanna stay attached to it, and then you do your final release in the bottom here. Um, the leak definitely got better, but you can see there's still that little persistent leak at five o'clock. Um, anybody, would anybody go after this at this point? No, yeah, I mean, we, we, again, we were worried mostly about hemolysis with a leak like that, and, and because it was outside of the surgical ring, I don't think that actually was gonna be a problem. Um, and then we, lo we love to use our hemodynamics to guide, to guide the outcome, and so, although it's not a totally normal left atrial tracing, I would say I felt really good about the reduction that occurred in a stepwise fashion with each step. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> it brings up a good point. So you, you've shown that you have a defect that either gets bigger with the, the shape change of the, the ring or the elimination of the competing flow through the center. So sometimes these just keep expanding if you, if you chase. Um, and I've had cases where you know more plugs were put in than what we measured. And then they said, oh, well, you underestimated the size. But actually, I think sometimes they just get bigger as you're putting these plugs in. I, I totally agree. Um, Transthoracic next day, by the way, shows no PVL whatsoever. So we were pretty happy. Um, and then here, my, sort of my summary slide. So I think it's very important to differentiate between where the leak is coming from, obviously, right? You have to define what you're treating, otherwise the treatments are gonna be very different. And I honestly think imaging is the most difficult part of this procedure. So we, we need to spend, you know, measure four times before you do anything. Um, and then it's just important to familiarize yourself with the various plug options. Um, you have to think about six steps ahead of time. You have to know what you're gonna be delivering it through. Um, what do you do if, the, if it fails? I always leave an extra wire in just in case so you can recap, makes recapturing easier. Um, and then I like to use hemodynamics. I think most people who do a lot of structural work rely very heavily on that. It's not just about color flow. It's, it's really about, you know, what is the patient going to feel? What is the heart going to feel? And so hemodynamics kind of guided our endpoint. We decided we're not touching that extra leak. I would be curious uh, what Gaurav says. So that, that appearance you showed of the, the leak on the CT outside the ring, the peri-ring defect, I mean, that's very common on CTs because the tissue plane there is very thin. Um, the way we see it on CT, um, so it's, I think you can call a lot of leaks, but I think a lot of it's just difficulty seeing that thin tissue plane. So when you put in the rings, the tissue plane around the annulus, does it get stretched out and thinned? What, is the, what does it look like? So, uh, this is not quite long, but what I, I think this comes from downsizing too much. There's too much stress on the annulus. So 30 ring in a degenerative valve is kind of small. It's a functional valve that's probably okay, but a degenerative that tends to be probably a pretty small ring. Um, you probably can tell by CT, you know, the color, but you can probably tell if, there's, if the ring is dehissed off the annulus. That's maybe better than, than an echo can. And you know, you're taking, again, a, a D shape and you're making it a circle, and there's less tissue medial and laterally, right? And, and 
A1 and P1 and A3 and P3, it's a much shorter leaflet. So it's co-opting reasonably well when it's a D shape yeah. with the rings in place. The moment you circularize that, you make it a circle, you're pulling apart A3 and yeah, that makes sense. So I don't think it's a question of you missed it, you got an image better. I think this is a this is a, an issue when you have ring dehiscence that particularly medial or laterally, you're gonna see this. I want to think. Yeah, no, I think I, 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 I totally think that makes perfect sense, and less so in this case because I couldn't prove it because we saw the leak before. But for the one I was just telling you about that we did last week, there was nothing, and it's totally we totally changed the geometry. Yep. I want to say I've, I've looked at some studies, and it's been it's at least ten percent of all surgical rings have some de dehiscence over time, but it doesn't really matter because you, you have, I mean, how many stitches, 13, 14, more, yeah, yeah um, but you know, for a degenerative valve, I mean, if you get a good repair, you don't even need the ring. I, I think that well, the ring dehiscence rate is much, much higher for tricuspid, anything you're downsizing, yeah. tricuspid or functional uh, MR where you're putting small rings in. But nowadays, more and more surgeons for degenerative are kind of true-sizing yeah, I, I guess my, my point would be that I think these small um, arc dehiscences probably aren't the actual cause of the patient's recurrent MR uh, in many cases, right? The vast majority of cases, it's, it's something else. The, the degenerative repair failed or the ventricle dilates or something else. Thank you, Andrew. And so uh, we always recognize that the last case of, of CVI before the case competition finals is uh, the mother of all structural challenges. And who better to deliver it home than Dr. Adnan? Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. It's it's been a great conference. Um, I actually, I don't know. I don't know. I can't beat these cases. So <laughs> those are my disclosures. Uh, so this lady is an 83-year-old lady. Uh, who had bioprosthetic uh, AVR uh, in 2014, 21 millimeter trifecta, uh, did very well uh, until three months prior, then had two CHF hospitalizations, was now on oxygen, her EF's down. Uh, you know, um, trifectas are tricky, as you guys know. So we had issues with um, the risk for coronary obstruction, uh, both the right and the left, uh, more uh, sinus sequestration on the left and uh, obstruction of the right. And this is her access, uh, her femoral access, so that was an issue. Um, and then there's the issue with, you know, just a 21 millimeter trifecta having a 19 millimeter true ID. We can't fracture a trifecta. We can consider, um, you know, remodeling a trifecta. We can uh, flare the posts. But, you know, as with many of you, I think, um, in, you know, we, we see all this stuff before we walk in the room, right? So we've looked at the CT and, you know, the history, and we know we have all these issues. And, um, you know, I said to my surgeon, uh, who, who's an you know, experienced surgeon and the one who operated on her in 2014, I said, if you can operate on this lady, I would appreciate it. And so, you know, we walk in the room and, uh, there's no way this lady is going to get through surgery. I think, Gaurav, there's, you know, there's no chance. And so we have to figure out what to do. Um, so what would you do, Ethan? Um, I mean, we would just try to give it a shot. Um, can you, did you show the CT? Can you show the CT? Yikes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we would try to remodel it and put in a self-expanding valve just to get the best possible gradients. Double, double basilica? Do something with the double basilica? Uh, AS, yeah. Uh, double basilica with what access? Since it's ultimate or mother of, let's say transcable. <laughs> so actually, Omar, so uh, uh, how, how much, uh, you know, Basilica is Joffre doing through alternative access? Ooh, alternative access, very little. 
Yeah, that was our that was Very our little. concern. I, you know, I, so I, what's I, the access for double doing silica? Well. Crowded. So, but how do you do the double basilica? <laughs> Yeah, so we've talked about that. So Keith has, you know, had this idea to do, do a basilica from the neck. I think it'd be very difficult, though. Um, I mean, the, the ergonomics of that and the challenge from the ergonomics, you could really get into a heap of trouble. Yeah, and we're not even, you know, I mean, when we do carotid, uh, you know, Keith is Keith is like in the first operator position, you know, and so it's just very difficult because uh, we're we're behind. You know, it's one thing to put a taver through. Uh, and, that, and that's fine, but to you know do the manipulations needed for basilica is be hard from you know standing a few feet away from the patient. Um, I like the trans cable idea. Yeah. It still only gets you one large bore access, right? Well, we need yeah. two. We need two. <laughs> well, could you? I mean, couldn't you put a twenty dry seal through uh, the trans cable? Yeah. 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 And if you did that, maybe you could put a couple of six multis. Right for one for one basilica. Well, just snorkel the other one and be ready to Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what we did is um, six French uh, femoral access, left a sided BA basilica. You know, it's interesting. I don't know how many of you guys have done this. Um, so I don't know if it, does, it doesn't show that well. So when you do a BA basilica, right, you traverse and then you do the um, balloon. So then when you're flying V is here, it's, it's not to the base because we've already, you know, ballooned this to open it up. So you're kind of just, um, you're kind of lacerating just the, you know, mid to tip of the uh, leaflet at that point. So I, I think that, show, you know, it just kind of shows us the, um, that, that we did accomplish what we wanted to accomplish by ballooning the base of the leaflet. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we did exactly as you said, Jason. Um, so, uh, can you explain the ballooning first? Does that just create a bigger split? Or yeah, yeah, right. That's the idea. Whoops. <coughs> so, um, right. So you traverse at the base as you would otherwise, but then uh, we used, I think, a five millimeter balloon to just uh, balloon the base of the leaflet, and then you lacerate the rest just to uh, have a bigger splay. How often are they doing it, Omar? Ballooning? Yeah. I don't know. I'll ask Josh. <laughs> well, it's interesting because this, this is the second case of this in two days. So somebody else showed also another balloon-based basilica yeah, yesterday. And so, so it, it's, I think it's actually becoming quite common. But it's typically a, a what I, what, what's that? Yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. I mean it doesn't add that much to the procedure. It's a pretty quick step. But it's yeah. I think it's worthwhile. And it's typically what Ethan, what size balloon do you We just use a four millimeter N C coronary balloon. And it looks like you did just one? And then you protected the right? And then, yeah, we decided. So yeah, you know, so I think what what we thought our option was was to do we could have done the left sided basilica taken out all of our equipment, gone back, you know, with both femoral arteries again, and done a right-sided basilica, but it, it just was a lot. <laughs> and we were doing transcrotted for the access, uh, for, for TAVR. And so we, you know, decided that in this lady, um, you know, we're just trying to get, you know, we're just trying to get her, uh, you know, out of, the, out of the lab alive and better. Uh, and normally we don't, you know, snorkel stent anymore, but we did in this case. So what we did is um, we went up, and, and, and you know, so what, what we worry about is, um, you know, when we're quote unquote protecting these arteries, you know, put a guide in and put the stent down and everything, we feel like, well, we're propping open the, you know, anatomy. And so we might pull all that out and then, you know, the RCA obstructs. So if we're gonna do this, we just do it. Like we, we, we are going to stent this. So we went up with the stent first, up with the taver, down with the taver, and then down on the stent balloon. Um, you know, so then we talk about Corval versus uh, Sapien. Do you, do you wanna just talk about how your snorkel stent, I mean, the technique of that, how far do you hang your stent out from the ostium? 
I mean, some yeah. people also have been doing this by putting uh, an extent guide extension into the art and into the right and then making a game time decision later. I mean, I, but right. you, you went straight in. So we've gone that. away from that because, okay. you know, we just feel so we have had the problem where if you don't have a guide extension. Now, this is back before we were doing Basilica and everything. But um, if we didn't have a guide extension, we'd had the problem where we had uh, stent stuck, you know, we couldn't get it out. Um, because it, you know you're trying to pull it out against the tavern frame, um, and we just you know had to deploy it. Um, but then now, like I like I was saying, I just you know all that equipment in the artery is pushing your leaflet away, and so um, you know we rarely do this. But if we're going to do it, I think we just we just commit to it that we're going to stunt. Um, Yeah, we well we did it in this case. No, I wouldn't say we do this very often. Yeah, well, I know. Uh, other thoughts. Uh, in the rare times that we that we have to do this, we um, we do exactly what you just described. I use a guideliner or a guidezilla, and put it down. Um, we always we feel the same way. We had an evolution also where we would kind of look and see and hope and pray and and then you're you got like a wire in there and you're like pulling the wire back very slowly and taking puffs hoping it doesn't. And then eventually it just obstructs, and you're like, oh man, it just has to happen one time, and then you never want to do it again. So, so we do exactly that, but then I'll pull the stent back um, and then deploy it afterwards. I've, I've never done one simultaneous, but I have had the situation where pulling the stent back, um, I wanted it to be back farther, and the frame still got in the way with the sapien. With the sapien. Um, and so it's, it's a challenge. Um, we had one very interesting case where for whatever reason, we didn't have a stent in that day, um, but we could not deliver our stent afterwards, even though we had a guideliner and everything else. And actually, what ended up working was like a ping pong guide technique. We got a second access. We re-engaged through the through the Edwards strut, and then we could. But we were keep we kept our equipment in to pin things open from the first guide, and then we could get the stent in through there. So that's what we'll often do. Actually, is do a ping pong technique. So um, in order to get the stent um, geometry a little bit better, um, so we'll have the guy liner and the wire down um, in order to protect, and then after the valve is deployed, we'll pull that back um, and see whether or not we can get another guide um, through the valve frame. Um, so then instead of snorkeling up, you're just bringing the stent dust to the frame of the valve, um, if that's possible. I think that's really smart. We don't do it routinely, but it it makes me feel better about the way it looks. And certainly for future re-interventions, um, it preserves the option of getting back in. So we haven't heard anything about BVR. You're like the BVR. Yeah, so, but, you know, so all things being equal, in a 21 trifecta, we would normally use a 23 core valve, uh, like Ethan suggested. Um, we would uh, use a 22 millimeter true balloon to remodel the trifecta. It'll flare the posts. Um, it's not going to do anything at the level of the ring, but it'll flare the post. And because core valve super annular, we're going to better expand uh, the the actual you know leaflets of the core valve. So we thought about that. So what that would have. So I think how we would have had to do that is um, we couldn't do this uh, you know kissing technique if if that's what we we're going to do. We would have had to deploy the core valve, do the BVR have your guidezilla down like you suggested um, and and then do the you know do the RCA stent at the end and you know again we, you know we chose to do this simply to try to make it a very complicated case uh, you know as simple as possible mean gradients 14 um, you know I don't know these are the limitations of dealing with trifectas no it's not going to help with a sapien Right, so, yeah. you know, so the sapien here is 20, right? Yeah. And so uh, flaring the posts of the trifecta with That's a sapien amazing. isn't going to do anything. So uh, the key learnings for us, so, um, so BVF or BVR can increase the risk of cornea obstruction during valve and valve taver. So uh, we, I think we talked about this a couple days ago as well. It, it depends on where the coronaries are. So... You know, for example, sorry, let's just say this was a different case and we were considering BVF. If the, if the coronaries are here, B 
BVF and BVR aren't going to change anything. If they're here, that, I mean, that's what we're affecting when we do BVF, right? And so if your coronaries are low, then it can you know, affect the risk of coronary obstruction, and we have to account for that. So we don't, you know, I showed the case partially because we don't always do BVF and BVR, even though <laughs> everybody thinks that's what we do. It, you know, it depends on the patient, right? Um, and then balloon-assisted basilica we've already talked about, and, uh, you know, yeah, this third point is, is um, you know, just important. Understanding what you're accomplishing uh, if you're going to do BVF and BVR. We make all these decisions now uh, up front, right? So we don't, we don't look at gradients anymore. Um, and then decide whether to do it. It's all, it's all based on, um, you know, the patient, the valve, the anatomy. Um, and so we, you know, we decide up front what we're going to do. Now, if this patient had better femoral, would you have done um, embolic protection in this case? Oh, that's a great question. So um, we, so, um, you know, so a lot of people think that valve and valve taver uh, or, you know, uh, valve and valve tower with BVF or BVR might increase the risk of stroke. I've heard that said many times when you put a sentinel in. We don't, we're not, uh, you know, we, we basically don't use sentinel at all. But um, we're, we are uh, actually doing a 20 patient study. Um, so we're putting sentinels in patients that we're doing BVF on and sending the filters to Renu Vermani's lab. And so I've got eight. Uh, reports back so far, we're going to get 20, and we, we can compare those to the uh, data from the Sentinel trial in terms of, you know, uh, particle, you know, size, type, amount, uh, and see if there's, you know, some difference between native valve taver and valve and valve taver plus BVF. Do, do you, and you don't use Sentinel even if you're doing uh, Basilica, typically? Nope. It sounds like, it sounds like yeah. you do. I mean, so, I mean, we've gone all over the map on this. So we started out doing Sentinel for everyone, and then when Protected Taver came out, we became, we, we stripped it down. But we still do it for people that were doing electric artery or if there's any visible clot. So it's a tiny percentage, but we still use some. What about others? We're the same. Yeah. We're, we're, we're exactly that way. We, we, you know, we, we started using Sentinel in every single case we could possibly use it in. And then anecdotally, internally, we felt that we weren't seeing a difference in the stroke risk. And then we had protected TAVR data to kind of back that up a little bit. But I want to believe that it does something. And I do think it can. But for Basilica, every single time we would do it, right? Um, same thing for, for Lampoon, if it's, if it's a calcified leaflet. If it's just straight MR, maybe not. Our center uses it 110% of the time on every case. I'm not, I don't agree with that, but that's, that's the, the process that's been in place for quite some time. Michigan has more money. <laughs> well, fantastic. Well, thanks everyone. We'll conclude this session. Uh, if, you wanna, if you're interested and wanna come over, the case competition finals are gonna happen in 15 minutes and there's lunch there if you like. Uh, I can't remember which salon it is, but it's on your app, but I think it's over next door. So thanks everyone. Thank you.